Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, then my name is Aaron. I'm a junior doctor working in London. And in this video, I'm gonna talk you through how to take a focused neurological history. And then I'm gonna look at four possible cases that could easily come up in your OSCE exams and how we could go about presenting those cases to an examiner. If you've got your finals coming up and you wanna jump straight to the cases, then yeah, feel free to go for it. Okay, so let's jump straight into it. And I'm gonna show you how I use my eight step approach to taking any kind of classic history from a patient, but adapting it for a neurological history where usually the presenting complaint is something like headache. Okay, so step one of the eight step approach is initiate the session. And this involves three things. Number one, introduce yourself. Number two, confirm you have the correct patient. And number three, start to try and build some of that doctor patient rapport. So in this case, you could try something like, hi there, my name is Aaron Kiru. I'm one of the medical students. Is it Mr. Smith? Hi, Mr. Smith, nice to meet you. I understand you've come in with some headache, is that correct? Okay, I'm really sorry to hear that. I've asked for some pain relief, it should be on its way. Is it okay in the meantime, if I start by asking you some questions? I think at the start by offering some sort of analgesia or pain relief, I think straight away your patient or your actor is on your side. They know that you actually care and they're more likely to give some information to you as part of that history. Okay, so under step two, which is screen for symptoms. So the point of this part of the history is to try and identify the big problems that the patient has been experiencing. So you could say something like, you mentioned headache, have you noticed anything else? Oh, okay, so that's headache and vomiting. Anything else at all? And the point here is to try and kind of divide the history into the two or three big symptoms that the patient have been experiencing, and then you can go attack with them individually onto step three. So step three is gathering information. And like I said, this is where you tackle each of these big symptoms individually. So with each of those symptoms, you'd start with a very open question. Uh, so if with headache, you'd say something like, tell me about your headache. You'd listen, 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 let the patient speak. And then you'd move on to very focused and closed questions to kind of try and fill in any gaps that the patient hasn't mentioned. So with your focus closed questions, with something like headache or chest pain, any kind of pain symptoms, you can just use a mnemonic Socrates. So S stands for sight, so where exactly is the headache? So if the patient says the headache's usually behind both eyes, you'd be thinking more, could this be a cluster headache? O stands for onset, so did the pain come on gradually or slowly? C stands for character, so what kind of character pain is this? Uh, if the patient kind of describes very intermittent bursts of sudden pain, then you could be thinking something like a multiple sclerosis picture or some sort of demyelinating pathology where you get these kind of multiple episodes separated by time and space. R stands for radiation, so does the pain move anywhere? So A stands for any associated symptoms, so when the pain comes on, do you notice anything else at the same time? So say your patient says, I've got a headache that's really focused around the eye. At the same time, I also noticed the eye became very red and my vision became very blurred. You could be thinking, could this be kind of an acute ankle closure glaucoma? T stands for time, so how long the symptoms lasted, and there's one particular kind of pathology where this is really relevant in neuro histories, and that's kind of with your TIA and stroke. So if you've got a patient that's reporting kind of unilateral facial weakness and drooping, then if those symptoms last for less than 24 hours, you're straight away thinking this is more likely a TIA, so transient ischemic attack. If you've got the same symptoms, but they've lasted for more than 24 hours, then that's more pointing towards a stroke. E stands for exacerbating and relieving factors. Do, so does anything make the pain better or worse? And finally, S stands for severity. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the pain? Okay, so on to step four, which is summarize. So at this point, you've got lots of information from step three, which is gathering the information with your open and closed questions. So I think it's a perfect time to summarize and examiners absolutely love to see students summarize. So just to summarize what you've told me, you mentioned you've had this three day history of eight out of 10, frontal pain just behind the eyes and also you've had this one episode of vomiting and a little bit of ringing in the ears is that correct have i missed anything okay so on to step five which is your risk factors so this is the part of the history that i always used to miss out on which is why i've given it its own section the point here is to really try and help you narrow down your differential lists and examiners absolutely love to see kind of students exclude certain differentials from their kind of questions um, rather than kind of blindly asking vague neurological questions, not in a specific order. So for any neurological history, I like to ask four groups of risk factor questions. The first group is your trauma question. So have you hit your head at all in the last 12 months? The next thing is your raised intracranial pressure question. So any early morning vomiting, any tinnitus, and does your headache get worse when you move your head up and down? Then the meningism question. So 
Have you noticed any photophobia? Have you noticed any neck stiffness? Any recent rash or fever? And finally, your giant cell arthritis, so your GCA question. So any pain over the temporal region, any jaw claudication, so any pain on swallowing, and any blurred vision. Okay, so under step six, which is your systems review. So this is where you can do a very body system focused review of symptoms to make sure you haven't missed anything from your initial screen right at the start of your history. So for a neurological systems review, I like to say, I've got a few specific questions to ask in a row now. Have you noticed any headaches, any visual disturbances, any loss of consciousness, any weakness, any numbness, any fits or seizures, any change in your smell, taste or hearing, and any balance problems? It's also helpful at the end of your system review questions to ask about constitutional symptoms. So these are a group of four symptoms that can literally affect any body system, so they're always relevant, and they include fever, weight loss, tiredness, and loss of appetite. Okay, so on to step seven, which is the patient perspective, and that includes the patient's ideas, concerns, and expectations. So have you got any idea what might be going on? Is there anything in particular you're worried about? And what are you really hoping for from today? And it's really important not to just kind of clump all of this at the end. As I always say, try and be dynamic, be fluid, ask these questions as the patient offers you cues. And then finally, step eight to finish off your history is the background history. And it's nice at this point to signpost both to your examiner and to your patient that this is what you're moving on to. So I like to ask some background questions now. Are you normally fit and well? Do you suffer from any medical problems? Do you have any allergies, etc., etc.? And that's it. That's the kind of eight step approach, but tailored for a specific neurological history. What I really like about this approach is the way it kind of nicely translates into a format that's clear, concise to present your history back to your examiner. So I always use the same kind of presentation format. It's fairly straightforward, fairly generic. You start off with a very brief introduction where you mention the patient's name, age, and occupation. Then you go to the patient's presenting complaint, and this is all that information from your open and closed questions. Then you mention kind of any other symptoms. So that's things that you got from your screening. And then you mention the patient's eyes. So any ideas, concerns, expectations, and then any relevant negatives. So things that you could have got from your system review or risk factor questions and kind of bring all of this together. What is your top differential? If you're feeling brave, if it's something you're confident with, you can kind of go a bit extra in your presentation. So you could talk about kind of other differentials that are kind of less likely, but important to consider. Going back to your top differential, you can think about what are the possible or most likely cause of this diagnosis. And then finally, complications of that differential, common complications that you're aware of and you'd want to exclude. And I think that gives a kind of really thorough, but also concise presentation of a history into a one minute format for your examiner. Okay, so what I wanna do now is kind of show you that presentation format in four kind of classic cases that could get thrown at you in your kind of neurological history OSCE station. So this first case is your classic case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I had the pleasure of talking to this 53 year old lady, Mrs. Smith, who is a teacher. She presents with a 12 hour history of a 10 out of 10 headache, which she describes as the worst headache she has ever experienced. She says it started at the back of the head. Also of note is she mentions two episodes of vomiting. She reports some neck stiffness. There's no photophobia. She says she smokes and also drinks alcohol and has a past medical history of hypertension as well as adult polycystic kidney disease. What she seems to be most worried about is a potential stroke. My relevant negative findings are that reassuringly she reports no head trauma in the last 12 months and no signs of true meningism. So I think putting all of this together, my top differential here would be subarachnoid hemorrhage. Other differentials that I think are less likely but important to consider would be things like meningitis as well as encephalitis or migraine. Thinking about kind of the possible cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think the past medical history of adult polycystic kidney disease is especially relevant, as I know that's a known association of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Thinking back to subarachnoid hemorrhage and its possible complications, things I'd want to be aware of and possibly exclude quite early on would be things like seizures as well as hydrocephalus from kind of that blood in the brain causing raised intracranial pressure. Okay, so the second case is your classic history of a TIA transient ischemic attack. So I had the pleasure of talking to this 72 year old gentleman, Mr. Smith, who's a retired IT teacher. He presents today with a 30 minute history of sudden onset left-sided weakness, 
which is reassuringly resolved. This whole episode lasted 30 minutes and his strength has come back to normal, but he does still report some left-sided numbness. He does admit to having lots of vascular risk factors, so he's a type 2 diabetic, he has high blood pressure and also smokes 20 cigarettes a day for the last 50 years. Overall, he doesn't seem to be too concerned about this entire experience as it's only lasted 30 minutes. Uh, my relevant negative findings are that reassuringly there's no head trauma in the last 12 months, there's no visual symptoms and also there's no signs of true meningism. So putting all of this together, I think my top differential would be a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. Other differentials that I think are important but less likely and important to consider would be things like a stroke, as well as a potential space occupying lesion, so things like a tumor or an abscess. Regarding the possible cause of the TIA, I think the fact that this patient has a very extensive vascular history, so things like diabetes, blood pressure, the kind of very large smoking pack history, I think this all points towards a TIA, most likely secondary to atherosclerosis, rather than say a congenital AVM, arteriovenous malformation. Possible complications that I'm aware of, of things like TIA and stroke that I'd want to exclude would be things like raised intracranial pressure, as well as seizures. So under case three, which is a case of giant cell arteritis. So I had the pleasure today of talking to Mr. Smith, who is a Caucasian 70 year old gentleman who is a retired investment banker. He presents to me today with a 12 hour history of nine out of 10 throbbing headache, which he says is located between his right eye and his right ear. Also of note is he says it's very sensitive and very painful and tender over his right temple region. He says that he's had some pain when eating his food and he has a past medical history of polymyalgia rheumatica. Overall, he seems to be most worried about a potential stroke, which he's had in the past. My relevant negative findings are that reassuringly, there's been no head trauma in the last 12 months. There's no visual symptoms and there's also no signs of true meningism. So I think putting all of this together, my top differential would be giant cell arteritis. Other differentials that I think are less likely but important to exclude would include migraine as well as tension headache. I think regarding the cause of the giant cell arteritis, I think the fact that this patient is Caucasian, uh, elderly, as well as uh, the fact that there's got a past medical history of polymyalgia rheumatica, all points towards giant cell arthritis as these are all kind of known risk factors. Possible complications of giant cell arthritis I'd want to exclude would include involvement of the posterior ciliary arteries, which could lead to kind of permanent vision loss. So I think in this case, I'd be very, very keen to start steroids imminently. So this final case is a case of meningitis. So today I had the pleasure of talking to a 19 year old lady, Miss Jane Smith, who is a student. She reports today a six hour history of a seven out of 10 generalized headache, kind of crampy in nature all over her head. She feels that it's starting to radiate down towards her neck. She finds her neck very stiff. She says she was very photophobic this morning. She vomited three times and also had a fever of 41 degrees last night. Overall, she's quite worried about the whole thing, but she's not sure what's going on. Uh, my relevant negative findings are that reassuringly she reports no kind of head trauma in the last 12 months and also kind of no change in her taste or smell. So I think putting all of this together, my top differential would be meningitis. Other differentials that I think are less likely but very important to consider would be things like encephalitis or a migraine. With regard to the meningitis, I think the most likely cause would be a bacterial or viral meningitis. However, I'd want to perform a lumbar puncture to be sure of this and send off some CSF samples. Okay, thanks for watching guys. That brings us to the end of this video. We've gone over the eight step approach tailored to a focused neurological history. And then we've also had a look at four possible cases that could come up in your neuro history station in your exam. So hope you found that useful guys. If you did, then please drop a like. Uh, let me know in the comments what worked and what didn't, what other content you want. And if you did find it useful, then please consider subscribing and hopefully some of my other videos will be useful to you as well. So thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one.